forensic science. And so for me, the question, why human trafficking, starts with why forensics. The summer after my junior year of high school, um, a recently graduated senior and one of my older brother's good friends, Marley Lyon, was shot and killed while sleeping in his car. Two weeks after his murder, the, through forensics and ballistics, they were able to identify the four men who killed him. And two years later, prosecuted them and put them in jail for the rest of their lives. And so that, for me, that justice that was brought for our, to our community through the identification of those men really caused me to want to pursue a career in forensics so I could bring similar justice to other communities. And then that fall of my senior year of high school, Beth Redman from the A21 campaign, which is an anti-trafficking nonprofit organization, came and spoke at my church. And that was the first time ooh, I heard about human trafficking as an issue. And I was shocked. I was horrified that this was taking place in, around the world and in the United States. And so my sophomore year of high school, or my sophomore year of college, so last year, I participated in a program called Human Rights in Modern Day Slavery where with 14 other students, I studied human trafficking for the, the year, and we were, able to visit, we were able to travel out to Los Angeles to visit the Lo Los Angeles Police Department and speak with their anti-trafficking task force. We were also able to meet with victims of human trafficking and survivors, Ema Matul and Maria Suarez. And I'm going to tell you a little, about her, little bit about her story, because it's really why I'm here to pursue a career in ending human trafficking. At the age of 16, Maria came to the United States from Mexico with the hope of getting a job, with being able to earn money to help support her family back in Mexico. Instead, she was tricked by this couple and forced to, forced, um, to work at their house for five years. She was not able to communicate with her family. She wasn't able to leave. She was verbally, mentally, and physically abused. And she, she was trafficked. She was forced into this situation by a couple who promised her a job. And after five years, um, the man who had trafficked Maria was murdered, and the, his murderer blamed Maria. She didn't speak English, so she didn't know what was going on, and she was put in jail for 22 years for murder. While in jail, she was able to learn English and learn about her case. She learned about why she was in jail and said, hey, I didn't do that. I didn't commit murder. I was trafficked. I was being abused. And so she was able to fight her case and was released from jail. And through her experience, what she focused on in telling us her story was forgiveness. She forgave her trafficker. She thought it was horrible what he did to her, but she forgave him and was going to use her story to help other women and to help other women who had been rescued from situations similar to hers. And so a little bit about what is human trafficking? Human trafficking is in two forms. There's sex trafficking and there's labor trafficking. And by definition, sex trafficking is a commercial sex, sex act induced by forced fraud or coercion. And it's if a person is under the, years of 18, under the age of 18, it, even if they are complying with this forced prostitution, it's sex trafficking because they're not able to consent. They're under the age. And so labor trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person. It's subjection to involuntary servitude by debt bondage or slavery. And so what's the problem? No one really knows what the scope of the issue of human trafficking is around the world. It's, these are images that I got from the internet this past month, and it's between 21 and 35.8 million people worldwide that is suspected to be trafficked. And 15 million people is a huge gap. That's a lot of people, and no one really knows the scope of this problem. But more or less, no one really knows that it's an American issue. Sex trafficking is happening in America every day. It's, you know, as this graphic says, 200 cases of sex trafficking were identified in Wisconsin last year. And from 1996 to 2007, 435 pimps were arrested in Nevada. And so that really shows that it is an American problem. It's not something that's just happening overseas. And specifically, it, surrounding the Super Bowl, there were 550 Johns, or sex buyers, who were arrested, 23 traffickers arrested, and 68 victims, including 14 juveniles, rescued. And this happened in a two-week sting operation conducted in 17 states and 40 jurisdictions. And so this really shows that surrounding the Super Bowl, surrounding this American sport, this sex trafficking is happening. And so 
what are people doing? And so Polaris and the International Justice Mission are two well-known anti-trafficking nonprofit organizations that based off of the United States. Polaris focuses on trafficking in the States, while the International Justice Mission focuses on trafficking all over the world. And Dr. Timothy Pombach is a leading researcher in DNA analysis, which I'll talk about shortly. And so this, is, um, this map was taken off Polaris's website on their analysis of the sex trafficking in the United States in 2014. Polaris hosts the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, which is a 24-hour hotline that victims of trafficking, those who suspect trafficking, or community members and families can call and say, I think that I've seen trafficking. I think that my family member has been trafficked. And so this map, if you can find your hometown, I think that's can find your hometown and see is trafficking present because it's tra present in all 50 states. And based off of the hotline from last year, there, it's suspected that there are 4.5 million people involved in sex trafficking in the United States. And that of those 4.5 million people, 95% were females. And of those 95%, 60% were aged from 14 to 21. And while a lot of the other, the other 40% is below 14, it, the youngest age that they found was 10, um, but it goes all the way up to adulthood. And so this really shows the scope of trafficking as an American issue. This is 2014, this is last year that these cases were reported. And so the International Justice Mission last summer conducted a study in the Dom Dominican Republic to really identify the scope of the issue. And they threw mapping techniques and then going into the Dominican Republic and speaking with people and talking to locals and talking to those who have been trafficked, they were able to determine how pre what the prevalence of human trafficking is. And so on this map, this is a map done by IJM, and the green dots represent established areas, so brothels and discos, nightclubs, massage parlors, anything that can be kind of masked as a hub for human trafficking. And then the red dots actually represent the non-established areas, so parks, beaches, roads. And that's where they found that human trafficking was most present in this area. And so they found that, um, that the pre humans of tra human trafficking was pre more prevalent on the streets than it was in the brothels, and that 10% of the people that they were able to identify as victims of human trafficking were children. So finally, the research of Dr. Timothy Pombach I came across this summer. He is, him and his lab in New Haven, Connecticut, are working to determine if forensic DNA typing can be used to identify victims of human trafficking. Finding this research was really exciting for me because this is the question that I have been wanting to ask. Can my love for forensics and my love for science be combined with this passion I have for ending human trafficking? And this is the research that he's doing right now. And so the goal of his research is really to use this human identification to reduce the to allow for victims of human trafficking not have to testify in court so that they can use this evidence, this, this guaranteed evidence to convict um, traffickers and pimps. And so in this reading, I found this quote by Dr. Pombach, which reassured to me that what I wanted to do was possible and was necessary. And it says that there's a need for procedures to collect physical evidence that will be beneficial in the identification of individuals participating in the sex trafficking trade. This research, this science-based forensic methodology that I want to create is necessary and is going to be extremely helpful in identifying and rescuing a victim of human trafficking. So what's my mission? I want to develop the standardized forensic methodology to identify and rescue, rescue victims of human trafficking, but I believe it can't be done unless I'm able to form connections between the anti-trafficking nonprofit organizations like Polaris and the International Justice Mission with law enforcement agencies and the government and re forensic research labs like Dr. Pombach's. And so that's really my mission is to first connect these different areas so that then together they can cre I can help create this forensic methodology. And so what's my action plan? First, I'm going to continue researching what's being done right now. I'll talk about later. There are hundreds of anti-trafficking nonprofit organizations that are all working towards the same goal. And so I need to keep f figuring out what's being done in law enforcement agencies, what's being done by these nonprofit organizations, so that I can get a scope of the get a scope of what's be, what's happening, and also obtain a graduate degree in forensic biology. I, if I'm going to if I'm going to create this forensic methodology, I'm going to have to fully understand 
what techniques are being done in the, in the world of forensics to identify victims. And so then I will reach out to different organizations and try to make connections between them and figure out how these connections can be made. I'll begin prototyping the forensic methodology based off of DNA analysis, implement the methodology, and then begin identifying and rescuing victims. So as I talked about, this global, global modern slavery directory shows the number of anti-trafficking organizations around the world, but specifically, I zoomed in on the United States. And as you can see, across the United States, there are over 200 organizations. And they're all doing different things, whether they're working on advocacy, client services, research, identifying and rescuing victims. They're all working towards a common goal. And so what I really want to do is find a way to connect them all, to, to use the data that they all have in one, in one kind of contained manner to identify and rescue victims. And so then, what are the limitations? The scope of the issue is huge. As I talked about earlier, no one really knows how many people are involved in sex trafficking in the United States or worldwide. And so while the scope of the issue is daunting, I know that if I can implement this methodology, I'll be able to clearly define how many people are involved in trafficking in the United States, so then we can start chipping away at this number. And then the legality of using DNA for human identification for those who might not be classified as missing or consent to DNA analysis. The methods that Dr. Pombach used in Nepal, in Costa Rica, in his study, he went in undercover, acted as though he was a John, and his team, they were Johns, and they collected DNA through straws and cigarette butts and cups. And while for some of the victims they were able to use, get buccal swabs, it, took, it takes a lot of trust for these girls to allow someone to take their DNA. And so that, was, that is a limitation faced with this um, methodology. And then education experience. I'm 20 years old. I go to college. I'm not a mas I don't have a master's degree in forensics. And so while I'm, gonna, while I'm working towards these goals, I'm going to focus on what I can do now to further the production of this methodology. And then creating a solid network of partners and mentors Everyone wants to end human trafficking, all these 200 organizations, but a problem is how am I going to figure out how they can work together, but then how they can still work individually towards ending this goal. And so what I've done so far, this is a huge issue. It's a big problem that I see. And so right now what I've been doing is I've been able to get in contact with people at the International Justice Mission. My mentor works at IJM, so he was able to get me in contact with the Vice President of Investigations and Law Enforcement, and I spoke with him on how he, who he was the former director of NCIS. And so I talked to him about how he believed NGOs like IJM can be connected with law enforcement agencies like NCIS. And we really spoke about the connections that they have and how I can further the connect connections. And then I've actually, I've reached out to Dr. Timothy Palmback and I'm going to Skype him when I get home and talk about what he's been doing and how, as a 20-year-old biology major, I can help and how I can learn about what he's doing in the DNA analysis. And I've also reached out to the data analysis director at Polaris to speak with her on how their data can be used by other organizations to really identify these victims and determine the scope of the issue. And I've begun write, began writing a research paper on the different organizations and the different methodologies I've found to really find a, to really kind of, I don't know, combine everything that I've learned and everything that I've researched this summer into one page so that I can, when I go reach out to these organizations, I can say, this is what I've done, this is the problem I see, and this is how I'm going to fix it, and this is how I want to fix it. And so that's still a work in progress, but that's something that I've really been working on developing this summer. So my short-term goals, to complete the paper. It's been, <laughs> that has been a struggle for me. Um, as a science person, I'm not very creative, and writing is not my forte. But I've been working on developing this research paper and this explanation of what I want to do. And then also to make connections with different nonprofit organizations. Because there are so many, I'm going to have to continue reaching out and continue talking to people and telling them what I see as the issue and just learning about what they're doing. 
And then long-term goals, I hope to develop this forensic methodology. Whether it takes 10 years or 20 years, this is I'm something that I'm extremely passionate about and something that I know is going to be really helpful in ending human trafficking. And so if I can develop this methodology and then have it be implemented by research labs and by law enforcement agencies, I know that I can make a difference. And also form connections between the law enforcement agencies and the nonprofit organizations. And finally, to raise awareness of the issue of sex trafficking in the United States. While my friends from school and friends from home know that I'm here and have heard me give my spiel a million times on why human trafficking is relevant and why people need to focus on it, not many people know about it, especially students our age. And so I really want to continue raising awareness for the issue of sex trafficking. And so how I determine success. For me, success will be first finishing my paper and sending it to people, but then also by connecting different organizations and developing a plan with them to create this science-based methodology. Because it's such a huge issue, if I can create this small success and make these small goals, I know that I'll eventually be able to, to reach my long-term goal of ending human trafficking. And so, any questions? sure about the rate of prosecution. I know that it's been increased and that there are a lot of laws surrounding prostitution and trafficking that are continuing to be changed and to being updated. But the, there's a fear installed in these women by their traffickers that if they testify, they'll be killed. Their family will be killed. They will, you know, if they run away from these men, they will come find them and bring them back. And so by using DNA evidence, it would help the, the victims wouldn't have to testify this fear that they have and the trauma that they've had from this experience, they wouldn't have to relive it. There would be this hard DNA evidence that says they have been trafficked and that this man or woman needs to be prosecuted for the crime. Yes, Dr. Bradburn. Emily, that was fantastic. First of all, you should never describe yourself as not being creative. You're creative. <laughs> <laughs> an extraordinarily creative uh, approach, I think. Uh, I'm baffled by the lack of awareness about the continuing existence of human slavery and sex trafficking in this country and, every, and, and really everywhere. It's, people are not aware of it, and, and uh, it is, it's got to be frustrating for somebody like you who works <laughs> this cause and wants to get the word out. And if you just, if, I mean, are there moments to use? I mean, it seems like we're in a moment now uh, with issues of race and conversations about race and the legacy of slavery with the flag, the Confederate flag, everybody's outraged about the flag, what it represents. One of the things it represents is, is slavery, of course, and uh, it seems like people should be aware that slavery still exists in all these different ways. So how do you, I mean, how do you get more traction on the outrage about the issue that can get some, get some momentum going? I think situations like this that I'm able to get up here and talk to people about my cause, but also a funny story. On the plane coming up to D.C., the man sitting next to me asked me, so what you doing? Where are you going? What's your, you know, what's your plan? And so I explained to him, oh, I'm going to D.C. for this program. And he's like, what's the premise of the program? So I explained to him about human trafficking. <laughs> exactly. So I explained to him, human, you know, I gave a brief story of human trafficking and what I wanted to do and how I hoped I could use forensics to end human trafficking. And he was just, he was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, when you're on TV someday for working in human trafficking, I'm going to be like, I sat next to that girl on an airplane. <laughs> and it's things like that that are really reassuring to me that, you know, I told this one person about the issue of human trafficking and he was shocked. He was amazed and he is now thinking about it and is aware of it as an issue. And so if I'm able to just tell people about it, and while I would rather work in a lab and do the forensic side of it, if I'm able to just tell people about it, that's really reassuring for me. Yeah, Helen. So in addition to being a biology major, you're also doing leadership studies. Yes. Um, so I'm interested, how is that informing your work in human trafficking? And as a part two to this question, have you thought about ways to use new media and the internet and blogging and things to, to begin raising this awareness, especially as a current student? 
Well, the issue of human trafficking is all over the internet. There's hundreds of organizations that have websites, and there's there's campaigns like um, and the red X on your hand that was the end slavery and. So I, it's all over the internet. I know I don't think that I can have a role in that because that's not something that I would be interested in. But in terms of leadership studies, I I thought it was interesting when I got to Richmond. It's a study that not many people are able to to go into, and so I think that it's helped me kind of shape how I think of issues. And while in biology you work in a lab, you do lab work, you learn about DNA and cells and learning about leadership studies, I'm able to learn about how humans interact and how I can, you know, talk more about the issue of human trafficking, connect with people and tell them how they can make a difference. And so that's really connected into this program about how I've learned about myself as a leader and how I can go and tell more people about the issue. Yeah, Chinema. I have a question about the research paper you're planning on writing. Um, in like a perfect world, who would you hope Will it be able to read the paper? Well, it's not really a paper. It's more, well, eventually would be a paper. Right now, I'm really working on just a two-page description of what I want to do, of the issue that I see, and where I see the holes, and where I see a void, and how I think I can fix it. And so, I'm not really sure. I'm, that's a work in progress right now, but I'm hoping to send it to people like Mark Cookie, who's the Vice President of Law Enforcement, and to have him kind of while I've talked, spoken to him on the phone about what I want to do, if I can give him a hard copy of this is what I want to do and this is why, I feel like that will allow people to really understand more of my cause and why I'm passionate about it. Yeah, Amanda? Um, so as a non-science person myself, I'm really fascinated by the idea of a science-based methodology, and I was really interested to hear about Dr. Palmbach. So um, how does what you're thinking about the science-based methodology, how does it build on that or work with that? What are you thinking in terms of what you'd like to explore with DNA um, just in general? I'd just love to hear a little bit more about that methodology that you're thinking about. Okay, well, forensics and DNA analysis are being used today in homicides, in rape cases, and so that technique and that analysis is already being used, and so if I can use those techniques that they have and apply them to human trafficking, which is, I think, what Dr. Pombach's trying to do, because in homicide cases, you have the DNA already, and you're able to go through, and, you know, if they are reported as missing, and if there's a if there's a database out there that previously had their DNA, they're able to identify them. But with these girls, a lot of times, their identities have been changed. They were taken as young girls, and so they don't really know where they're from and what their background was. And so, or they're not reported as missing. A lot of times in countries, families sell their daughters into slavery to earn money, or men force their wives and girlfriends into prostitution to make more money for them. And so I'm not really sure how it can be used for those victims, for those that have been reported as missing, or it's just using this identification because by DNA analysis, you can identify hair color, eye color, background, you know, where the country of origin. And so those markers can really help identification for these women that maybe don't have an identity or have their identity has been taken and changed. Any other questions? Okay. Hear me? Does this work? Okay. <laughs> oh, wrong way. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Clara Milakovic. I'm a student at the University of South Carolina, and today I'll be telling you about my capstone project, which I had the privilege to develop with the support of the Mount Vernon Leadership Program. 
and it's um, implementing a hands-on cooking class at my university called Eating Well, Healthy Cooking for the 21st Century. So I'm really passionate about healthy living, but this passion didn't happen overnight. Um, growing up, Growing up, food was really the, the center of family life. I have a lot of fond memories about food. Um, one of them is visiting my grandparents in Serbia. You can see the picture right there. I'm with my grandfather there, and I was picking pears off of one of the trees in their yard, and we would pick them together and like eat the fruit straight off the branches together. Um, I also vividly remember my dad, whenever he makes Italian food, he has this thing where he, he has to listen to Italian opera. So, <laughs> yeah, this is a real thing. So he'll, <laughs> so he'll, he'll blast Italian opera throughout the house. And I remember just walking into the house and watching him stir the tomato sauce and sing, singing along to like Pavarotti and like all these other opera singers. So really from the beginning, I saw food as a way to bind my family and my friends together. Um, so, okay, yeah, and so this is a picture um, with my family there. We're enjoying Italian food, of course. Uh, this is some um, traditional, Serbian, traditional Serbian food. Um, yes, and so this was really like a fairy-like fairy -like, um, childhood relationship with food. And this relationship quite drastically changed when I entered my first year at the University of South Carolina. Suddenly, I was simultaneously bombarded with unhealthy food and dieting trends. I learned about the scary term called the freshman 15, which is the belief that all freshmen gain 15 pounds their first year of college. I vowed to escape the statistic. <laughs> At first, I, all my dietary choices were rooted in the desire to stay healthy. I avoided burgers and fries like cats avoid water. I exercised regularly. And then things got more extreme. I cut out meat and dairy and most grains because I thought they were too fattening. I um, started exercising compulsively. I um, began to drastically restrict my food portions, um, and I really started exhibiting very um, destructive behaviors. Uh, I, I vividly remember going to a party with my friends, and we were just having a great time, and I ate a piece of cake. And I felt so terrible about myself that I left the party early, um, put on my workout clothes, and went to the gym. So these were very dangerous behaviors, and eventually I just stopped eating. So um, this really took, um, my relationship with food really took an ugly shift. Instead of it being a balanced source of happiness, it really had become a source of endless frustration. Um, I, I didn't know what to do, but I kind of mentally blocked what was going on because I thought I was just being healthy. Um, by the end of freshman year, I had lost so much weight that I started developing very severe health complications, and um, that summer I received medical attention. So um, this experience really opened my eyes. I, I realized that there are huge problems on college campuses, and part of Oh, well, okay, well, there's a happy ending, don't worry. <laughs> okay. So, um, basically, the summer during my freshman year, or the summer after my freshman year, um, when I was beginning my road to recovery, I read a very powerful book um, called In Defense of Food, An Eater's Manifesto by Michael Pollan. And in it, he argues, um, he advocates for the for eating real whole foods and supporting local agriculture. I became involved in my city's farmer's market and I also became involved in a student organization on my campus called the Real Food Challenge. And we are um, helping to shift 20% of my university's food budget towards um, local and sustainable foods. 
And finally, during my second year of college, I really rediscovered my, my love for food um, through cooking with my family and friends. Um, and this is a picture of me, my sister, and my brother-in-law at um, my city's farmer's market. So that was during my second year of college. So this very personal journey um, towards finding a balance with food really opened my eyes to an issue on campus. And that was the fact that there, on campus, there exists really two extremes. Students who don't care at all about what they eat and students who care too much. So you can see here that 30% of college students are overweight or obese, and at the same time, 25% of college-aged women have reported to using binging and purging as weight management techniques. Clearly, these are two enormous extremes. Faced with the daunting task of feeding themselves, yet clueless on how to do it, students fall back on canned soup and fast food, or they resort to celery sticks and 100 calorie snack packs. So this really is one of the reasons why malnutrition is such a huge issue in our society. I asked myself, how can I bridge this gap? How can I help students find that balance that I had to find for myself? And of course, with the support of my family and friends, how could they do it? And I realized that they could do it in much the same way that I did it through cooking. So I really, that's really why I'm so passionate about healthy eating, because I think that students could find a balance with cooking. Cooking not only, allow, not only shows students that they are in charge of their dietary choices, but it also fosters an environmental ethic and provides a productive, restorative outlet for stress. It shows students that they can find that balance. So, my class. Um, I am pl hoping, I'm planning to implement it at my university's honors college. It would be offered as a three credit course, and it would have three main components. The first, of course, would be the hands on cooking class, which would take place at my university in their. Um, campus kitchen labs, which are actually really nice. I always get like a burst of adrenaline when I go in there because it's like also like new. Um, so, okay. yeah, okay. And so um, also um, the experience of cooking would serve as a starting point for students to learn about the many issues that intersect in our food system. And this would be done through readings and lectures. Oh, sorry. Okay, and then finally, um, students would engage in a final project of their choice, and they would have one of three options. Um, they could choose to place their experience in the classroom in a broader context. So um, they would have the opportunity to engage in their community in a way that is relevant to the class. For example, volunteering at a local farm. Um, they, had, they would have the option to um, create an independent project or paper of their choice. So an example of this would be creating a documentary that analyzes the methods by which um, food is taken from the farm to the university dining halls. But that's just one example. And finally, students would have the choice to peer model. So they would take the experiences and cooking skills that they're learning in class and they would um, create environments with their friends where they could teach their friends how to cook. Um, and they would document their experiences either in a video or in a paper um, and really talk about their experience in the class. So this, these class, this class would have four really overarching goals. The first would be to teach cooking skills through experiential learning. Students would learn how to cook um, simple and healthy meals. They would also learn um, street smarts. So for example, creating a food budget or uh, learning how to navigate their grocery store. Secondly, students would learn how to engage as consumers in their community's local and sustainable food system. Um, so for example, students will learn about CSA, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It is um, really, it's, it's an idea that 
connects consumers with local farms. So students, um, students and everyone else can um, connect with a farm in their area, pay a uh, seasonal membership, and then they receive weekly boxes of fresh produce that's delivered to them within 24 hours of being picked. So, and I was involved in that uh, last year as well. So uh, thirdly, um, the class would seek to increase awareness about the many issues such as political, um, economic, social, public health, um, those issues that intersect in our food systems. Um, students would learn about the role of the food industry on the economic and political stages. They would learn about how their um, consumer choices really have impacts on their local community, but also in the world. Um, so students would also learn, for example, about the mistreatment of migrant workers. And fourthly, um, I hope that this class will really build and sustain a community that is passionate about healthy eating. Um, I think that for me personally, this is one of the most important parts. I hope that students will take what they learn in the class, whether it's the hands-on cooking that they um, experience or that they learn, or um, learning about just the world around them and how food really does have greater impacts than just eating it and being done with it. So I really want them to take what they've learned in the class and apply it to their daily life. So see that cooking doesn't have to be expensive and time consuming, that they can do it with their friends, that they can engage in their local community. Um, for example, one way that I build community with my friends at college is that every Saturday morning we go, usually, um, we'll go to the, our farmer's market and we'll load up on brightly colored fruits and vegetables and then we'll have what we call a cook day where we all cook a meal together and then we sit down and share it and talk about our week together and talk about what's new in our life and really just bonding over food and showing students that there is a balance, that they can enjoy food, that it is really a life-giving thing, and that they can find that balance. So um, I'm really excited to collaborate with people in my community and those um, farther away. So I'm talking with my honors college now, and they're very excited about the idea. They um, are working with me currently to either implement the class as a social science or as a service learning requirement. So um, also, I'm in contact with two local farms in my area called um, Carolina Community Garden and City Roots. And I'm working with them to organize guided tours for the students and volunteer opportunities and just in general ways for the students to get involved and learn about it. Uh, and finally, I've been um, in contact with Ms. Patricia Moore Pastides. Um, she is my university's first lady and she's very actively involved in farm to table methods. And she's very excited about my class and said that she would love to be a guest speaker. So that's just something that I'm really excited about. Um, so as Washington said, um, deeds, not words. So this is my, um, this is my action plan. Um, so my action plan has four main, four main stages and my roles really evolve over time. Um, initially, I will be the leader. I will be initiating all the efforts of this class. I'll be working to, I'll be collaborating with my honors college, with professors, with students. We'll be, um, I'll be building up the curriculum, working on the syllabus, um, helping find professors and chefs who would work for the class, who would work with the class. Um, then the second phase would be prototyping. So I'm planning to apply for a grant at my university and I would use this grant money to um, create like cooking sessions in the spring semester where students would come um, learn how to make healthy and simple recipes and then they would fill out evaluations really talking about their experience in the class and what they liked, what they didn't like and we would use the students input in the actual design of the class. Um, so we would really cater the class to the students' needs. Oh, somebody got that joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay. Thirdly, um, I'll be taking on more of a manager role. <laughs> oh gosh, I love you so much. Okay. So, <laughs> I'll be taking on more of a manager role um, with implementing the class. Uh, once we implement the class, I really want to shift the responsibility towards the university. Um, and really just continuing to coordinate efforts and working to make the class self-sustaining. Uh, and finally, by the time I graduate, I want the class to be fully um, self-sustaining and I want it to be regularly offered um, throughout my university. And if this class is successful um, at my university, I hope to plant it at other colleges across, um, really across the nation. So. Okay, so my passion for healthy eating um, and cooking really won't stop with my project. Um, my, my personal experience um, and my, really my, the personal way that I found a balance with food and the way that I want to help other students find a balance with food won't end. Um, I hope to use my passion for preventative care and healthy eating to become a medical doctor and work in this um, much, really much needed area. So I hope to work um, in preventative care and I would love to place a greater emphasis um, in our community of healthy eating um, and really of taking care of yourself and the people around you. So, um, Yes, I think that it's, it's very exciting and I wouldn't be where I am today without, um, without my personal experiences and the people who have supported me through them. Um, I want to thank the Mount Vernon Leadership Program for um, really taking a chance on me and accepting me into the program and letting me grow um, and putting my ideas into actions. Um, I'd like to thank my peers and now my friends um, really for, for letting me bounce my ideas off of you guys and giving me the support that I needed. And I, I would be remiss to, to leave out my wonderful mentor, Juju Harris. Um, so I think that um, I really wouldn't be where I am today without all of you guys. So thank you. Thank you again so much. And I'll, I'll take questions. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Maddie. Okay, I have two questions. Okay. One, can you define and like talk a little bit about what real food is? Okay. And then two, can you talk a little bit about students who are like on the dining hall, uh, who are using the dining hall, mm -hmm. who like don't get to cook but picking healthier options? Mm -hmm. Of course. Those are two very great questions. Um, so first, um, to answer your question about real food. It's real food, really, we don't need to complicate it. Real food is just whole, unprocessed food. So do you think Cheetos is real food? No. Good, good, <laughs> good, okay. Okay, do you think a tomato is real food? Yes. Yes, okay. So really just food in its purest form, that is real food. Um, and basically, one of the advice that I give to myself and to a lot of people is from one of my favorite authors, Michael Pollan. He said um, that if your great-grandmother doesn't recognize it, it isn't real food. <laughs> so just, um, we don't need to complicate it. It's really as simple as that. Um, to answer your second question, that, that's very true. Many students do not have the option um, of cooking for themselves when they're on um, a college campus, but I think um, they do have the opportunity to eat healthy and to find a balance. Um, one of the reason, one of the ways is to live by that, is it real food, is it not? Um, I think part of it's educating yourself about what does my body need. Um, learning about what constitutes a balanced meal, um, what food gives me the most satisfaction and is still good for my body. Um, so again, I mean, you know how you can really answer it for yourself. Like if you're in a dining hall, um, 
like you can look at food and ask yourself like is it real or is it not so really I it doesn't need to be eating salads every day. There, there are healthier options that exist. Um, but yeah, I, I could talk forever about this, I'm sorry. So yeah, just a, like eating balanced food and knowing um, what is highly processed and what isn't, so. That's a good question. Okay. Um, one thing that I really want students to walk away with is um, the nutritional implications of their food choices. Um, for, for the biggest health issues that are in our country are diabetes, heart disease, um, and these are all chronic issues, and many of them develop over time as a result of poor diet and low physical activity. So I really want students to know that, to realize that their food choices have nutritional impact. Um, so that's sort of the nutritional side of it. As for the socioeconomic, um, socioeconomic lessons that I want them to learn is I want them to learn how to find, how to, really the importance of voting with their dollar. Um, so you can, when you go into a grocery store, you have the money and whether you realize it or not, you are voting. So really choosing food that you can stand behind and that you support. Um, so for example, a lot of the food that is produced by the food industry um, uses like mistreat mistreatment of migrant workers. Um, there's a doc documentary called Rape in the Fields that quite literally talks about um, the mistreatment of these, of these workers. Um, and just showing students that by plugging into their local and sustainable food economy and choosing to um, support organizations and groups and companies by which they can stand by their values, um, I think that's something else that I want students to walk away with. So just learning about like the food industry and its impacts on society. Um, I mean, did you, did you guys see the pictures of the two chickens? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, so, I mean, little stuff like that, I think is important too, so. Yes, Dr. Bradburn. Uh, thank you very much. It was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I thank you. I have a question about, um, I, I think it's a great project. What are some of the uh, allies uh, on the campus at USC, the other, groups that, you know, would be sympathetic to what you're trying to achieve? Um, so when you say sympathetic, you mean they would actively work with me? Yeah, or spread the word, or mm -hmm. help you build your, your network across the school, or... That's a great, uh, that's a great question. So I mentioned briefly one of the groups that I'm involved in now, the Real Food Challenge. Um, they are quite literally in support of real food. So I've, I've been actually in communication with them and um, they're very excited about the idea and we are planning to, um, we're planning to sort of spread the word through classroom presentations this year um, and like in student organization fairs, talking about this class. So I know that I'll be working with them. Um, there are also several professors that are very enthusiastic about um, healthy eating. For example, on my campus, there's um, a man named Chef Brian Hayes. He teaches um, cooking classes, and he is also very actively involved in local foods. Uh, another person is um, Miss Patricia Moore Pastides. She is Pretty much, she's like the closest thing to a celebrity on my campus. She's, she's every, everyone really loves her, and um, she, we've, I mean, I've interviewed her, and she's, um, I have like, I have a very great working relationship with her, so I know she'd be supportive. Um, and I think that there's a growing need on campuses for these sort of essential life skills to be taught. And I think that the university is slowly beginning to recognize that. So um, if the administration is um, willing to work with me and they have verbally told me so. Yes, Melissa. Sarah, that was fantastic, thank you. Um, to piggyback on 
some of the previous comments. I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to work uh, with the staff directly in the residence hall environment. I know there are RA staff that are often starving for programs, no pun intended there, but they, <laughs> they, they usually, like if there's a fill opportunity, they're willing to hop onto that right away because they've got the money, they've got the attention of, of the students living within their area. So I'm just wondering if you've done any programming directly uh, within the halls at all. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't. That is a fantastic idea, it's though. A pilot opportunity mm -hmm. prior to the class, actually. That's that's a great idea. I can see um, working with the grant that I hopefully yeah. receive and working in conjunction with the residence halls. Um, that that's a fantastic idea. Yes, Abby. Um, this is actually more of a piggyback off of that. Um, <laughs> I'm good friends with someone who is a residence hall director in the first year women's dorm um, wow. on campus. Mm -hmm. So if you would like a contact, remind me afterwards. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, Mark? Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any other schools or any kind of other kind of curriculums that you're trying to learn from from doing this. And also, once you've got, uh, like, got your, once this is going getting started, like, how can people learn? What, what do you think people will be able to learn from you in order to like, plant this in other schools that you say? Because my, my school, I just got a brand new like kitchen lab, and I'm excited about it too. Yeah. I have no idea what like the school's doing with it yet. I'm mm -hmm. sure it just stayed empty. Mm -hmm. If I would yeah. have to, like yeah. connect someone who was interested in starting like in cooking and food nutrition education, uh, and connecting that to like the work you're doing, the work that other people are doing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Really, a question. Just I don't know. I just mm -hmm. I'm interested in that. Oh, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and let me know after I finish babbling, let me know if I answer your question. <laughs> okay. So as for using, as for learning from others, um, there are actually um, a lot of great resources out there that I have been um, learning from. There, I have not yet come across a cooking class that is offered for credit and that can potentially satisfy a graduation requirement that students need. Um, so that's sort of a new edge to my class that I think will be a big draw for students. Um, so I, t there are two big um, organizations that I've been learning from. The first is um, Stanford University has a Cooking 101 class for students. That's not offered for credit. I think students, students need to, to like pay for it, just like outside of their regular classes. Um, and I've been using sort of the um, so I've been using their ideas sort of as a jump start for my class. Not not 100%, but I've been like using some of their ideas, like the way that they approach teaching students about cooking, um, their class sizes, that sort of thing. Um, and also, John Hopkins University, their School of Public Health, has a class called uh, Introduction to Food Systems. And so I'll be... Um, Hopefully, I'll, I'll be reaching out to them soon and potentially looking to collaborate with them to um, integrate the more socioeconomic and public health and political issues that surround food. So those are two resources that I'm looking into. Um, what was the second part of your question? Like, what uh, other... How, how people can, like, how you see this planting, this idea to other schools. Mm -hmm. What do you think that will look like and how soon can it happen? <laughs> Not soon enough, like, 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 it can't happen soon enough. Does that make sense? Wait, did that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, I want it to happen soon. Um, but I think the way that I envision it is reaching out to university administration um, and really um, working with the um, administration that deals with creating classes and implementing them. Um, and I would probably also contact student organizations um, and organizations and people that would be supportive of my class that are already on that campus and, and talking with them and seeing if there's a real interest at that university and then approaching the administration and saying there is a need for your camp on your campus for this um, class. There has been demonstrated interest and really starting up conversation and working to implement it um, and really just spreading the word. I think most students want, 
Most students really like food and they do want to find a balance. They enjoy eating, they enjoy cooking. And so I think that there is interest. So really just getting the word out and seeing how you know, I can collaborate with different students and we can all use our different strengths to um, implement this class at their universities. Because I don't want it to be all me. I want there to be a sense of responsibility among those students on their campus. So that when I slowly pull out and move to plant classes at other universities, there'll be that class and there'll be that student at those universities who will have a sense of ownership over it and who will continue to support it. Yes, Helen. First of all, excellent job. Thanks. That means a lot coming from you. You're an excellent public speaker. <laughs> um, so I think this is really exciting and it comes at a time when colleges and universities are really in transition and we all know the college is getting astronomically expensive mm -hmm. and people, as there's more access to online um, education, people are questioning more and more like, why do we even go to college in the first place? And it occurred to me as you were speaking, another piece is that as gender roles have changed and mm -hmm. women are more and more able to, ha to, to go to school and to be yes. to professionals, that idea of cooking as a woman's task mm -hmm. is going away. Mm -hmm. My dad was always the cook in my own home and I fully expect my future spouse to cook for me. Air high five. <laughs> so I'm curious, how do you see this fitting in with larger cultural shifts such as the change in university education and the change of, in how our personal lives and our, our eating lives are intertwined? I think it will definitely, this class and this movement will shift with culture. Uh, I think you're very right in pointing that out. I hope that my class, I, I fully expect there to be an equal representation of men and women in the class. I think that, um, I mean, I think that there is definitely a more, there's an interest not only with women for cooking, but also men. Um, and I think that um, really spreading the word and showing that cooking is for everyone, cooking builds community. Um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely not a man's task, it's not a woman's task, it's just everyone's. It's, it's fun, like everyone should want to do it. And so um, just showing them that, um, you know, everyone can engage in this activity. Um, I think that it could definitely extend to, um, and like an, a more online learning. Um, I think though, it's very, it would be more, it'd be easier to learn about the political, social, economic issues that are intersecting in our food system online. But as for the hands-on cooking experience, I, I do think that that should happen in um, like a face-to-face -face interaction. So, okay, thank you very much. So like the slide says, my name is Sean Patrick McGinley. And today I'm going to be basically talking to you about my cause and about my passion like so many of my fellow fellows have before me. So before I get in, <laughs> I like it. Um, so before I get to that, first off, I just kind of want to talk about a little bit of a structure and a roadmap of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to start over, start with my story and how it's uh, evolved and how it's changed over the times. Then I'm going to talk about some of the work I've already been doing on my campus and then I'm going to be following up with what my actual, actual capstone project is and what I've been learning over these five and a half weeks at Mount Vernon. And I recognize the fact that I am the 14th to 15th fellows and so I'm going to hopefully try and keep this engaging and as fun as possible and hope you won't end up like this line by the end of it. <laughs> so let's get started. And let's get started with a little bit of story of mine. My passion for me really developed during my senior year of high school. 
specifically with the blood donation and the blood drive that came to my campus. It was a great opportunity for me. I had done community service in the past and I had talked about giving back and doing various efforts for the community. And you know, I always felt like I was doing it for the hours. It was a great resume boost. It was something I could put on my college application, but it was not something really that I identified with until a blood donation came to my campus or to my school. So my family had always talked about this. It was always something that was kind of very, I mean, kind of commonplace. My mom donated blood regularly, and we always joked about my sister's and my dad's extreme fear of needles. It was a common dinner time conversation, and I was super excited to actually be a part of this for the first time. The previous year, I had missed the day for the, uh, the age requirement by one single day, and I was stoked by the fact that I could finally give back and physically give to another cause. Although, on that day, I found out that I'm actually ineligible to donate blood. And I cannot donate blood because I'm gay. And for me, previous to this time, I had faced what it meant to be gay in various aspects of, you know, family rejection or friends leaving you and some of the social stigma around it. But this was really the first time that I experienced institutionalized discrimination against me for one of my identities. And this was really, looking back on it, the first time that I realized that I want to change the legal status of the LGBT community. So that's the start. And that's where I really came in with the legal aspect. And I kind of want to actually jump to the end. And specifically an event that occurred in a great moment on June 26, 2015, at approximately 10.05 a.m., I found out that the Supreme Court decided that same-sex marriage is legal in all 50 states. <laughs> <laughs> so com by complete serendipity, which I'm slowly figuring out is a theme of this program, we, <laughs> we happened to be there that day. We were meeting with Senator Kane's office in Virginia, or the Senator Kane from Virginia's office, and we got there an hour early, and we got a walk on the steps. So at 10.05, I joined this crowd. And for me, it was really a great moment. The country that I live in, the country that I was born in, the country that I'm a citizen in, has finally taken a step towards decreasing some of the discrimination that we experience, that we as a community experience. And granted, I recognize this is a very small step, but it was a still a huge step for me personally. I can honestly tell you that as we sat on those steps, I cried. For the first time in my life, I was so overcome with emotional happiness that I had nothing else to do but to physically release it in the form of tears. It was a great moment for me, and it was a great experience for something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. I literally experienced history. So what happened? I started with somebody who didn't know about discrimination that well, and then I ended up crying on the steps of the Supreme Court after a five and a half week long fellowship in Washington, D.C. There's obviously a chunk missing somewhere. And honestly, what happened is I went to college. Um, <laughs> specifically, <laughs> specifically, I attend the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado, where I study mechanical engineering. And this is a great school. It's considered the top engineering school in the country, and it's really producing some of our world's leading engineers that come from all over the world and go everywhere. It's a really great opportunity for me, and I'm learning a lot about the equations that dictate our lives, but yet something is missing. Something is missing in my education that's just not fulfilling me to the full potential that it could be. And honestly, what I think that is, is the people. I can tell you so many equations and so many theories and everything about engineering and the application of mechanics, and yet, the social structures in which operate, or the social structures in which engineering operates, isn't part of my education. In fact, one of my friends once told me that she's really happy she's not involved in the McBride Honors Program, a program dedicated to the liberal arts, because now she doesn't have to pretend that she cares. It's a common theme that's found throughout my campus that engineering and the social sciences do not intersect at all. And for me, that's really a problem. And specifically, that comes down to my involvement with the LGBT community. This is really something that is missing and a gap in my education system, especially considering the campus climate that I live in. So to specifically to talk about that, I want to talk about the Campus Pride Index. So Campus Pride is the national organization that seeks to enhance the education and leadership opportunities for LGBT students on college campuses. For every college, they give them the opportunity to fill out what's considered the Campus Pride Index. And this basically ranks them and tells them what they're doing right and areas in which they can improve on. And unfortunately, the study was done about five or six years ago for the Colorado School of Mines, but it was so bad that only one administrator has seen it, and they dictated that it cannot be seen to the general public. Fortunately, through my mentor, I've been able to connect with the head of Campus Pride, and I was able to see this survey, and it really was as bad as I expected. My campus ranked at a mere two out of five stars, and equated to about 33%. So honestly, we barely even made that second star. So for me, this was pretty alarming, but then I actually started reading through the survey and I got even more concerned. To start, for academic life, we ranked at a mere 10%. So this is saying that within our curriculum, we are not required to talk about the LGBT community and honestly social situations beyond that. 
The administrator who filled out this survey said that since we're an engineering and implied campus, implied science campus only, there just isn't room, which I don't believe is true. In addition to that, for support and institutional commitment, we ranked at a mere 4%. So once students come to our campus, our campus is doing very little, basically nothing, to support them once they're there. All we have is one club, an organization called OSIM, which I'm a member of, and that is our only resource for LGBT students. We do not have any sort of support or uh, LGBT center on campus, and we have no full-time faculty devoted to us. To put that into comparison, the University of Colorado Boulder, which is just a half an hour away from us, has three support networks at their school. We have one club. So for me, that's a problem. But on top of that, for recruitment and retention efforts, we ranked at 0%. My school isn't doing absolutely nothing to recruit nor retain LGBT students. In fact, one of my friends and one of my colleagues was able to talk to an administrator about this, and they said that, well, if they're not staying on our campus, then they shouldn't have come here in the first place. So for me, that's a serious issue. And although some of these are scary, one of the ones that really gets me and still scares me is the fact for campus safety, we ranked at 0%. The LGBT students on my campus are not safe. If a bias incident or a hate incident were to occur on my campus, there is no structure for that to be reported or for that to be taken care of in any means. The students have to deal with it completely on their own. Now, at this point, I've given you a lot of statistics, and you're probably starting to think, but Sean, what does this actually mean? You know, what does this mean to be a student? What does this mean to be LGBT on the Colorado School of Mines? And that's why I handed out those note cards to you earlier. So I want you to look at them. And if you have a black circle on your square, will you please stand up? Or a black circle on your note card, will you please stand up? This represents the approximate 30% of students who intentionally use the word gay or faggot on the Colorado School of Mines campus. Now 30%, you can sit down. 30% um, is just the statistics. But considering the fact that there's 5,000 students on my campus, that means 1,500 of them will intentionally use one of these two words to insult another person. That's pretty scary. Now, if you have a black triangle on your square or on your note card, will you please stand up? This represents the approximately 15% of students who identify as LGBT on my campus. So I talked about earlier, you can sit down, um, sorry. When I talked about earlier about those students who aren't safe and those students who aren't being recruited or retained or supported at all, that is that 15% that just stood up. 15% of my campus. It's approximately 750 students. Now, of these 50, or sorry, if you have a black square on your note card, will you please stand up? This is the approximately 60% of those 15% of students that have never come out before. 40% of these students have only come out to a select few people, and of that, 20, and an additional 20% have never come out to another person. You can sit down. So in the community that are you face, or for groups and organizations, or for people on my campus that face already the intense academic life and the intense struggles of what it means to be a college student, they're also going some, through an intense little, and, an intense emotional chaos they don't know how to properly process because they can't talk to about it, it with anybody. With a, within a community where one in eight uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual students will attempt suicide and one in two trans people will attempt suicide within their lifetime and at a college where one of the, with one of the highest suicide rates in the country, that statistic really scares me. We just don't have the means to address this and support this yet. Now, if you have a black X on your note card, will you please stand up? This represents the approximately 85% of first year LGBT students who will drop out of the Colorado School of Mines by the end of their first year. 80, you can sit down. 85% of students will, mo will not make it towards the end of their first year. They will never become those great engineers. They will never solve the world problems. They will never reach their full potential because of one aspect of their identity that may be limiting their education. So for me, that's why I've decided to devote my um, capstone project to increasing the visibility and accessibility to resources for LGBT students on the Colorado School of Mines campus. But again, I address the fact that I've only talked about statistics up to this point. And I want to give you a little bit of a personal story of how this has interacted with me on my campus. So over this past year, I had the great opportunity to be an RA for my second and returning year. And I was an RA in the Department of Residence Life, which is considered to be one of the most LGBT-friendly groups on campus. It was a great opportunity for me. And, even, and in addition to that, one of the staff members that I worked with, let's just say, didn't necessarily agree with how sexual orientation and religion intersected. And we 
by no means ever reached a consensus with each other, but we always understood where each other stand, which for me, that's the best I can get. We had conversations about this kind of topic, and we would talk about it, and like I said, we never really got anywhere, but I always knew where we stood. And I think that's a great first step. But that changed one day on March 23rd when he sent me an article further outlining his, I, his opinion on how religion and, and sexuality come together. And I said politely that I don't agree, but thanks for sharing in a little bit more of an eloquent way. And then he responded with one of the most hateful and rude and hurtful comments that I've ever received in my entire life. This entire message, which was also sent over Facebook, was sent to me and it included things such as me being a sexual deviation and a filthy sinner, with on, along with many other words culminating into a line that I was unnatural, evil, and deserving to rot in the flames for all eternity, flames of hell for all eternity. I received this from another staff member. This wasn't somebody random. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, this is so fun. <laughs> I'm planning on going into law. Um, is it working? I guess I don't think it's working. Can you
anything, Will? Oh, can we turn the volume? There we go. Testing. Yep, Will's just testing. That's a bright light. Yay. Are we good, Will? Can you hear it now? <coughs> Can you hear me? Oh, uh, he, he's saying he can't hear me. So can you hear me at all now, Will? How about now? Now? Keep talking. Continue to talk? Okay. Well, it's a lovely day outside, I hear. I don't know because I've been in here all day. I wish I brought a blanket because it's quite chilly. <laughs> Good. Great. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool. I'll just hold this. Well, are we all good to go? Cool, thank you. All right, guys, so I'm the final fellow, so let's enjoy the ride. <laughs> All right, guys, so um, this is my presentation. I think one of my biggest takeaways from this fellowship is the recognition of the fact that who I am on the inside and my cause needs to be in alignment. The cause needs to be something I truly care about, so that when I leave this room a week from now, a month from now, half a year from now, 10 years from now, I would still care about it. So today for me to explain to you my capstone project, we need to do, to do a little bit of backtracking to who I am. So this is who I am. <laughs> when someone asks me this question, I would like to say I am the product of meeting the right people at the right times. I think the sheer fact I'm standing in front of you right now is no coincidence. I'm here because a lot of people have invested a lot of time in me, and I'm forever grateful for that. And between this little guy who's really good looking and this man who's exceptionally good looking, <laughs> a lot of things have happened over the years. And let me take you to my home, Brooklyn, New York, the Big Apple. Um, birthplace of Michael Jordan, home of Biggie Smalls. New York City has a lot of lights and glamour, as you can see from the movies and TV shows, Gossip Girl. But for me, Brooklyn has a very special place in my heart. Brooklyn, I feel like, is a place where you learn a lot of realities about life, how life really is. And then, sh and then when you, once you get the opportunity to adventure outside Brooklyn, you have the extra motivation to really succeed in what you do. Growing up, I had a lot of childhood friends in, in Brooklyn, a lot of great classmates, guys who I was on a basketball team with. But at this very moment, I've lost touch with most of my friends. I can't really give you a number about how many kids in my middle school class actually went to college. From my knowledge, only five of them actually went to college. And over the last couple of years, I, whenever I have self-reflection, I start asking myself, you know, what made it possible for me to get out of Brooklyn, to really go to the high school that I go to, to go to the college I go to, and to be able to stand in front of you today? And I think it's because of education. Uh, here are the symbols for two institutions that I very much love, my high school and my current university. My high school is very unique. It is an all-boy private school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. What's very unique about this institution is the fact that every student, regardless of your background, rich or poor, receives a full scholarship for four years. And this school is funded exclusively on alumni donation. So it's built with generosity, and everyone who graduates feels a sense of to whom much is given, much is expected. I confess that going to Regis High School was probably the happiest four years of my life. But I'm probably starting to think that it might be one of the saddest four years of my life. When I told you that you get a full scholarship regardless of your background, it still doesn't eliminate the fact that as a 16-year-old, as a 17-year-old, I was very insecure. In the same classroom with me would be a student whose mom was the former co-head of Morgan Stanley before the financial crisis. And I'm sitting in the same room as this student and my mom and dad are Chinese restaurant owners, immigrants, who work 365 days a year. Holidays like Thanksgiving are 
very optional in my household. So just for a 17-year-old, it's very hard to digest, you know, why is it that I'm not on equal playing fields? And for a long time, it really distorted my vision of how I view myself and how I view the whole world. And it really conjured up a lot of negative feelings. And the only way that I could cope with it was to channel all these energy into my academics. And for a long time, it worked really well. During my senior year, I was actually featured in the New York Times. I submitted my college essay um, in which I wrote about my experience as that kid from Brooklyn going to a prep school on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And the audience really found it to be an amazing story. Now, I was very happy. It actually came up on the same night as my high school prom. So my prom date, dad was very impressed. <laughs> um, and from there, I attended NYU for one year, but I felt that something wasn't right. I wasn't growing as an individual. I was still studying things that were considered practical college majors, economics and political science. I'm good in those subjects, but do I really love it? No. So I told my mom, mom, I'm a transfer, just somewhere. So I filled out a couple of applications, and that April of that year, I was accepted to Vanderbilt University um, on a very generous scholarship and grant. So there I was, that kid from Brooklyn, the grandson of southern Chinese farmers go to school in the south. <laughs> if Vanderbilt was really that southern of a school at this point. Um, but throughout both experiences, there was always a cultural shock. I always felt like a fish out of water. Something just doesn't feel quite right. There's still so much self-discovery that I need to do to feel comfortable with my own skin. But I recognized that I was indeed given a lot. Not in just terms of money, but people actually believe in me. And it is my duty to make it possible for someone else to pave that new path for the next generation of students. This year, something really amazing happened to me. So around every college admission season, I always get tons of random emails from students who are also applying to college saying, wow, I found you in the New York Times, great essay, and whatnot. And they would ask me, what is some advice you can give me in the coming months? And I would always give them the very ritualistic, politically correct advice of, you know, get this thing in on time, you know, make sure to write this, don't write that. But it was very much generic. And this year, I had a special young lady from Argentina who found The infrastructure around her does not encourage post-secondary education. And just hearing her story from a complete stranger, I, I sort of found a sort of resonance in me. Because my own mother, she quit after a few months of college because my grandfather couldn't afford to her school anymore. They started selling family furniture just to get through a couple of months. So I asked myself, you know, what would I want someone to do for my mother at age 18? So that random message from that girl on a November night became a year-long mentorship program throughout her college admissions process. I more or less functioned as her guidance counselor and also a financial aid correspondent to all the universities that she was applying to. That March, before decisions came out, I told her that I was very afraid. You know, your mentor who's very, you know, has a lot of bravado, very confident usually, is very afraid right now. He's very sad because it's not that I don't have confidence in you as a student. I'm afraid that you're going to get rejected on basis of the fact that you cannot pay for your education. You are an international student. All the international students I know come from fairly well-off backgrounds whose parents can afford to send their kids to a college in the U.S. I really think your chances are slim. But something amazing did happen. As you can see by the underlying text here, she won a full tuition scholarship to Northeastern University. And she'll be starting school here in the US in a, a few weeks. An amazing turnaround in just 12 months. Um, but after our mentorship concluded, I started to think about you know, how many brilliant kids are just like Delilah every year? How many of them fall through the cracks every year? You know, not everyone is as fortunate to have this kind of opportunity to connect with a mentor. And I started looking at some statistics of college tuition costs. In just the course of three years, college tuition just increased every single year. What you should view as an inherent human right, a right to education, has become more or less a privilege. So I started self-reflecting. I started asking myself, how can I extend this experience that Delilah had? How can I extend this to all the students just like her? both domestically and abroad. And 
That's when I told myself, well, I like entrepreneurship, so I'll do it myself. <laughs> and it is my pleasure to name my first uh, project after my favorite mentee, Delilah. And this is my statement. I'm going to try to eliminate the financial burden that incoming college students from underprivileged backgrounds face so that they can fully realize their academic and professional potentials. I also want them to have great mentoring so that they can actually get through their college careers in flying colors. And I want to accomplish this to a dual model. Let me explain to you. Um, there needs to be a mentorship component. I'm all this more or less um, after the dynamic between me and Delilah. So I want my mentor to be an upperclassman. I want someone who's old enough to have the experience of this is what you need to say, this is what you don't say, this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do. But I don't want them to be so old that they're very far removed from the experience. I want them to devote a certain amount of time out of every week to actually keep correspondences alive. You know, webcam if you need to. Whatever it takes to keep in touch. Because I truly want this to be a fulfilling experience, not just another line on your resume. I also would prefer, prefer that they attend a university that the mentee has an interest in applying so that when you connect them, there's an initial common ground already. I also want the college mentors to provide feedback throughout for college essays because I view them as windows into who you really are. The first moment as an 18-year-old where you can tell your life story and distinguish yourself from the crowd. And for students like Delilah, who are international students, and both for students domestically whose family do not understand the concept of financial aid, I want that college student to keep track of that process, making sure that all the FAFSA, all the CSS profiles are filled out and submitted on time. And finally, I want these mentors to be like big sister and big brother. You know, if they do attend the same college, I want them to say, you know what, how about this club? You know, do you want to get lunch like that? I want this to be a very fulfilling, mutually beneficial, mutually satisfying relationship. Now, the second part of my initiative is a crowdfunding platform uh, through the internet. This is a very, very simplified version of what I'm ultimately trying to do. This is more or less on the background of the initial model, but in the coming year, I want to develop this more and more so that the both part of the model are parallel to each other every year. So for example, if you can look at this right now, um, this is a right and left arrow. If you click on any of these, you can scroll through any number of students that work with my organization. And uh, here's a sample. His name is Lyle Lee. His GPA is three point whatever. <laughs> His SAT score is uh, good enough. Um, he's from Brooklyn, New York, and he has a fantastic mentor named uh, Alex Starr, right there in the crowd. Uh, if he was to go to college in Vanderbilt, he would like to study human uh, development and also finance. Um, he, interestingly, he was actually in the New York Times, so there's a hyperlink for you on the website. And here on the bottom, I might have, you know, maybe his, a copy of his personal statement or more videos that, you know, a self-testimony to what he wants to do in his life. Just anything that, lets you, that, lets, that, that provides a brief window into his life for a complete stranger. And you as the audience, here is a very important thing. Invest in me. After seeing all these statistics and basically the, bi all the biography, I want you to determine, is this someone that you can see as being a potential leader in the future? Do you want to invest in this young man? If yes, then just press that button and donate. I'm not asking for an outrageous amount. I'm asking for something from the price of a Starbucks latte, $5 per day to whatever amount that you see fit. And then maybe you can share this with your friends and say, this is an incredible young man. I believe in him. You should too. And who knows, maybe half a year from, from that time, he can send you an email saying, this is what I've been doing in the first semester of my college career. I'm looking to work in this internship. Thank you so much, my anonymous benefactors. Now, within the short term of this project, I'm looking at the initial launch. I'm looking at doing a beta test of two to three domestic students. And I also want to partner up these students with their individual mentors uh, for a whole year. And should the relationship really flourish, then they can take it whichever way they want. But before I even launch this program, I need to do a pre-launch round of donations. I don't know exactly how successful this will be, and I certainly do not want to let my students feel that I'm leaving them hanging in the air. So I want to provide at least a little bit of a cushion of funding just in case you know, I'm operating under worst case scenarios. Um, in the following two to, two to three years, granted that the initial launch is a success, I'm looking to recruit um, 15 to 20 students per class. I think that would be a great number to hit every single year. I want the students who are previous um, participants in my organization to also return as mentors. 
so that they can also give back because they have been given a lot. And I need to uh, start to recruit a startup team. I am a full-time college student and my schedule is very tight. So I do want to find other individuals, maybe students or staff members of my university with someone that is not affiliated with Vanderbilt to really help me out on this initiative. But I want people who are actually very passionate about this cause because there's not going to be that much of a salary to even contemplate <laughs> earning money. But I want this to be rewarding and I want to find people who feel the same kind of passion that I do in my stomach. Within the long term, I want this initiative to come to full circle. Delilah was the inspiration for this project and I want this one day to reach students just like her if my network becomes big enough for that kind of undertaking. I wanted to serve the gifted but underserved students of international countries whose parents are not the wealthiest members of their society so that they can also attend and get a great education here in the United States. I'm looking at perhaps two to three students to add on to a domestic class every single year and they'll be representatives for that country. I'm also looking to perhaps form regional partnerships with uh, that specific country. So I was actually in contact with a lady who was featured in Forbes magazine 30 Under 30 and her organization partners with regional scholarship foundations to sponsor students who are nearby. And I'm looking to reconnect with her very soon. And the last point, this is really my long-term vision. I want to create a community of high school students, their mentors, and benefactors. I want this to be long-lasting. Now, what I just told you in the last four minutes or so, that's a very idealized image of the world that I want to see happen, that little part of the world that I want to live in. But I do want to concede, you know, there are some definite challenges, and the challenges will go from pages on end, but I'm just going to give you a few that's been on my mind lately. I've been losing some sleep over. I'm worried about how I'm going to actually going to fund this project. As much as I want this to be a nonprofit, this organization needs to have some money to run its day-to-day -day operations, and funding is crucial just to upkeep even the initial website. I also need to look into equal funding among students that I profile. And let me explain. Let's say a student was, has a very compelling story. You know, he or she might be getting $6,000 of donation by the end of that college admission season. But someone who has less of a compelling story might not get that much, might get $1,000. You know, how do I explain this to a student? How do I communicate the realities of the world? You know, am I able to perhaps spread out the funding? Can I even do that? Those are questions I need to consider in the coming weeks. Then also tax filing. I do not want to have a horrible meeting with the IRS. So I need to learn a little bit more about that and see what benefits I can actually get out of it. And on the legal side is agreements, agreements, and agreements. Agreements with students means that I'm talking to you. I'm, you're representing my organization. I'm representing you in a certain facet. This is the relationship between us outside of just the mentorship. This is also business. These are the policies that we go by, and these are the rules that we both need to abide by. And I think it's crucial that I make those a gu a guidelines clear. Agreements with donors. I want to make it clear to donors that your role as an investor starts at a certain point and also ends at a certain point. That when you donate $10 and you regret it, you cannot just take it back. It is not that easy. And also, ultimately, agreements with universities. At a certain point, once I gain some traction, I want to get the institution involved in this process. Maybe reach out to an alumni base and saying, hey, this is a great idea. A tremendous student is coming in. Can you help me out with this student? And I also want to speak to university saying, hey, is what I'm doing sort of, you know, rub you off in the wrong way? Are you going to take away a little bit of financial aid because I raised X amount of money for that student already? These are all ongoing conversations that I need to have. And then some miscellaneous ones. Time commitment from the mentors. Um, I recognize that they are full-time college students and that sometimes if they have difficulty with their schedules, they might not want to back out or tell me just how busy they are. I want the communication to be clear, saying if you're having struggle with this, let me match them up with another mentor because I want this to be as beneficial for both parties as it can possibly be. And then exhausting donors. Um, I'm very much afraid that donors have to donate to five kids or so, feel like my wallet's a little bit empty, I'm not going to touch this website again. I need to figure out ways to constantly engage my community just to keep all the buzz alive throughout the whole year and then the next year and the next year. Now, immediately after I leave this room, when I take the airplane back to New York City tomorrow, I have an action plan, uh, post Mount Vernon Leadership Fellow Steps. Uh, when I hit New York City, I want to uh, reconnect with Grand Central Tech, which is a tech accelerator in the heart of Manhattan. I interned there last summer. I've lost some touch, but I need, want to go back again and just learn from the professionals that work in that office space 
ask them, do you have any advice for me, you know, someone who wants to become a social entrepreneur? And I need to sit down with lawyers and perhaps um, uh, accountants to see, you know, what, is, what are the legal and financial frameworks that I can work by, and from those I'll be deriving my policies from, both in writing and also in verbal communication. And then I also need to reach out to youth organizations and charitable foundations who actually believe in my mission. So if, for example, I can say to a, an organization that works with inner city youths, out of your graduating class this year, who are your most talented students? Can they work with me? How would you like me to work with them? Those are communications and networks that I need to have. And then as I go back to college at Vanderbilt, I'm, I'm going to tap into Peabody College Network. I'm a, currently a student uh, at Peabody. Peabody focuses a lot on education. I mainly want to learn a lot more from the professors outside of the classroom saying, you know, what do you see as a promising student? Am I doing these things correctly? Am I becoming too much of a businessman? Should I be more of an educator? I want to form like, an extensive network of advisors and mentors from Vanderbilt. I, I will also be looking at campus organizations that are very much relevant to my cause. So for example, Mark Chan, my good friend and my roommate in this fellowship, also works with students in Nashville. Maybe he's a possible source of inspiration and future help. And vice versa, I want to help him too. And then lastly, I need to start writing grants. Uh, I need, this is a skill that I need to pick up on. But specifically within the context of Vanderbilt, I want to ask them, you know, is there a sort of funding that you give to a social entrepreneur? Not an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur every year so that they can pursue a project uh, of, the, of this caliber. If they don't, then I want them to start one, and I want them to continue this every single year. Because I feel like kids in our generation, we do have this need to do some social good. But just that money is a big question. This is the end of my presentation. Um, before I end, I just want to give a lot of thank yous to Amanda, Abby, my mentor, Doug, and all the other, other mentors out there, and to every one of you guys. Um, I'm very bad at expressing feelings, but I just want to let you know that personally, I very much appreciate every single one of you, those who I consider to be closer friends and those who I didn't have the chance to really have good conversations with. Those are some of my deepest regrets. And I wish if I can go back again, I'll do things a little bit differently. But I just want you to know that you are an amazing group of people and that it has been my pleasure to be a part of you guys and really grow with you. And I really wish you guys the best of luck as we return back to school and go about our individual causes. So um, thank you. All right, so any questions for me? Yes, Abby. Um, I feel like I hadn't asked this before, but um, you know, you have two components to the organization that you're looking to start. There's the mentoring component and then there's the scholarship component. I noticed that um, a lot of the challenges that you're talking about tend to be more centered around the scholarship component. So my question for you is, as you're going forward and sort of figuring things out, is it your intention that both of these things are happening simultaneously, or do you see the possibility of you know, being able to move forward with mentoring more quickly than scholarships, or, or something along those lines? So I'm just curious about whether you're really focused on both aspects, or sort of feeling out how to get traction. Oh, Abby, that's a great question. Um, it's actually an ongoing process. So one of my biggest, I, I guess, um, um, accomplishments this uh, fellowship is the main that where my limits lie and where other people can come in. And definitely right now I have more of expertise in terms of men mentorship department because I have first-hand experience. Well, with crowdfunding, there's more research to be done. Again, tons of meetings, just as you pointed out. I think right now the crowdfunding is going to take a little bit of a backseat, just a little bit, as I focus on developing the mentorship part. I think my initial website is going to feature the students, just minus the crowdfunding. And once I figure out, once I, my network grows enough and I meet the right people, I want to be able to build the crowdfunding in so right now it's not going to be parallel to each other, but hopefully in the future, down the road, once I gain some traction, that will be the case. But yes, I'm, I'm really much, I very much want to look into the mentor, mentorship department. Mark pointed out this out to me saying, Lyle, Delilah got into the college and got that scholarship, not because of some crowdfunding website, but because you were there for her and you were, really, were ready to fight for her. And I want all my mentors to fight for their mentees. Juliana? Um, 
within the college, whether it's a upper classroom to freshmen or something, that you could kind of model it after? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, so at Vanderbilt, um, I, I was actually in uh, a lot of leadership programs too, and one of them was uh, Project I Am. So one of my mentors, um, um, Jeffrey Morris, he, he's actually going on to, to uh, grad school at Vanderbilt. So there's definitely tons of organizations just like it. Um, the thing with the mentorship component, what makes this so unique is that the mentorship starts immediately. It hits the ground as soon as college admission season starts. And it's a, year-long process was busy, 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 busy. It's not so much like grab a lunch this time or let's go hang out at this time because usually the mentors and mentees are not immediately within geographical distance of each other um, all the time. So although I'll be drawing up from the same elements as a typical mentorship program, I think mine is definitely going to have some very defining qualities. But I would definitely reach out to the head of all these organizations and just learn. I think learning is never a bad thing for me. <laughs> Um, it's Alex Starr. Um, great presentation. Um, the crowdfunding part is the complex part, as you well know, and whether you create a 501c3 or not is very, very important. You might want to consider advertising on your website as a way to bring in some income, and I bet a lot of universities might want to advertise for you. Um, but I guess the hard part is when you say invest in me, you may have three or four or <clears throat> ten students that you're trying to help at once. Some of them may just want to give generally to the fund and have you help anybody you can, you know, and just sort of create a fund. So you have to have that opportunity to not just to invest in one person, but to invest in the program, in the Delilah Foundation or whatever you're creating. And then you give the money to the person, which could lead to fraud, or you give it directly to the university. Yeah, so definitely. Uh, one of my biggest, um, one of my immediate steps as soon as I hit campus is I'm going to go visit the Vanderbilt um, financial aid office and really have a good sit down talk about what is the behind the scenes kind of thing. What is the ominous figure that flows over my head as I fill out my financial aid form every year? And we really say, you know, what is the policy that I can, what is, what, what can I actually do, you know, without getting in legal troubles? But you're definitely right. One of the things I'm considering doing is I'm basically the middleman for a large sum of money. You know, how does that money get filtered to, through me is a very, very crucial part of the equation. And it's something I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about. It's not something I can ignore. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bradburn. A lot of fantastic presentation. You've got a really nice way about you in front of the room. Congratulations. Uh, it, you know, it's such a, a, it's such a great plan. It's a big plan. You're going to need a great board of directors, you know, at, at a certain level. What is your, uh, maybe I missed this in the presentation, what is your, your timeline for the next year in terms of, you know, where you want to be a year from now? You want to be launching the, a year from now, or you want to be finishing with the mentorship of your first couple of people? What, what's your immediate sort of uh, year? Um, I want... I'm going to start small, and uh, I, the, the mentorship program is definitely going to take off this year. I can, I can make it happen perhaps a month or two. Finding the talented high school students is not going to be so much of a challenge because the very high school that I attend have students that are just like me, and students and my friends who are also from the Bronx, from the outer boroughs, who have graduated, all, most of them, they feel this, some of the same sentiments that I feel. They will be more than happy to become mentors for the next generation. So I definitely do want to get the mentorship component started as early as possible because I do not want to wait a year to help someone. Someone needs the help. And I really want to get that started. But throughout this year, I'm going to try to make some major headway in terms of crowdfunding. I need to get myself immersed within the tech startup world more. I need to learn how to be an entrepreneur. I think there's still so, so much I need to learn. And this year is going to be a constant learning process. But the mentorship part, I'm ready to rock and roll. Um, miss in the back. Can I just move over here so I don't get blinded? Yes. Yes. Um, I love this idea of crowdfunding. Um, there are so many incredible aspects of it that really resonate with what's happening right now. 
access to higher education, the practicality of higher education, um, I think the potential for crowdfunding, we don't even understand um, in terms of empowerment, individual empowerment of donors and how that can really engage, engage people. I think you have a really great understanding of the challenges that are before you. Um, and I want to raise one in particular. Um, you've talked about how one person's profile is going to be a little bit more of a snob story than another and they might get more money. But I'm wondering about your selection process for inviting students in. Um, I personally come from rural poverty, mm -hmm. but like you, I was self-motivated. I sought out the opportunities to you know, gain access to education. You seem to have an international focus, which is great, but I'm wondering about reaching out to disenfranchised high schoolers in our own country, mm -hmm. um, in more rural areas who don't have access to, you know, the upper east side schools that give, you know, um, scholarship. What kind of a, of a structure are you going to put in place in terms of a board that can do some of that outreach? Well, um, I think it's actually a great thing to actually get out of New York City and actually go visit a different state. Um, I think throughout this year, as, as my network expands, I do want to meet people from all different sorts of background. And thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. I'll definitely add that to my to-do to list. Whenever I meet someone who's not from uh, the Northeast or so, I'll say, please have this in mind. If you have any bright young student that you want to recommend to me, please send me an email, and I'll be more than happy to look over that profile. In terms of selection process for students, it is a difficult thing to do. Besides visiting the financial aid office, I need to go visit the college admissions office and say, what criteria do you use on a day-to-day -day basis to judge a student within 15 minutes of op opening up a folder, if there's actually even a physical folder these days? And from that, um, I'll be constructing an application. I'll probably take a few questions from Mount Vernon application too, because those are some hard questions that they ask. <laughs> I know, I, I spent like three days being a hermit on them. So I think the application in itself is going to be its own little animal, and I look forward to a challenge. But just thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. Yes. Can I just sit here so I don't look into the light anymore? <laughs> Yeah, um, definitely. I, I think in a, a year, a year ago, I would always, you know, I would let people into my life who have the necessary skills but don't have the right passion, and that's something that was, that was a learning experience. And I definitely try to find the right people who are the right fit for my organization. I definitely appreciate what you comment about a name, a blemish. I work in fashion design, so that is always on my mind in terms of what's your image to your audience. Um, no, but thank you so much for reminding me of that. Um, I'm. With the business plan, I'm currently in the process of actually constructing formal documents and printing them out. I'll probably put them in a binder and I'll call it the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but thank you so much. Phil just volunteered to look at it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah. Phil is the CFO of Mount Vernon. He deals with a lot of uh, non nonprofit donations. Yeah. Phil, we are going to be best buddies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I want to know when you're going to meet Delilah. Uh, when I'm going to meet her? Um, so she's actually flying to visit me at Vanderbilt before she goes to Boston. Yeah. So I guess I'll be taking my mentee to lunch 
at the cafeteria. <laughs> no, no, it'll be better than the cafeteria. Um, yeah, it'll be nice. So, is that all? I don't think I, I don't really think I need that. I, yeah. You turn that, turn that off. Are you straight? Raise the lights. Anyone there? Yeah, yeah, this is off the record. <laughs> uh, this is difficult to concentrate with the light on. Uh, but you all did a great job uh, concentrating with the light on. So, yeah, just, just turn off the power.